Listen. Page 392. We're going to start talking about uh, oh, don't fossils, miss so much. the history of life on Earth, geologic time. Wait, so we don't Interesting settle. stuff. We are done with genetics. Yes. Stop moving so much. Yes. 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 Okay. Can we fix the lighting in the room, please? Alright, my turn. Lesson. Stop talking. We know a lot about the history of life on Earth. Yes, we do. You don't need comments. Okay. Yeah. Have to do this every time? Apparently so. Um, a lot of what they've learned about the history of life on Earth comes from uh, evidence from rocks. Rocks contain a lot of information. One of the things that happens, if you take a rock and you break it open, you take a rock and you break it open, the rock actually has trapped inside it gases from when the rock was formed. Now we have ways of dating rocks to see how old they are. Called radioactive dating. Carbon dating is an example of radioactive dating. Carbon dating is not usually used to date rocks, it's usually used to date bones. But here's how it works. In radioactive dating, there's in a rock, there will be a certain type of element that's a radioactive element. A common one used is uranium. In any rock that you find, there's some uranium in there. And the thing about uranium, we call it U-235. It's radioactive, meaning it changes. It changes into a different form, which we call U-238. U-2 is a great name. Another comment on this? U-235 will change to U-238 over a known period of time. And eventually, in a, in a given rock, all the U-235 will be gone. There will be none left if the rock's old enough. If it's a young rock, there'll be a lot of U-235 still in it. So you can figure out the age of the rock based on how much U-235 is left in it. Old rocks have very little of this left. Young rocks have a lot of it. Well, it's radioactive dating. Yes? What would be considered a lot of U-235? Not to kill you? Well, the actual amount of U-235 in a given rock is tiny. It's, it's, it's very small. Oh, okay. But um, it will eventually become nothing. So if you're saying a, 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 a rock has a gram of U-235 in it, that would be, a gram is not very much, that would be a very uh, young rock. And if it has 0 .002 grams left in it, that would be a very old rock. So you're talking about very, you're talking about a very little amount, but it can be easily measured with the, the equipment that we have. How much yeah. does a mountain Wait, have? Wait, he had his hand up. How much, how right. old are rocks? Um, the oldest rocks we find on Earth are about 4 billion years. 4 billion years old. And the youngest rocks we find on Earth are, for, are just formed from lava coming up from volcanoes and such. How much yes, does so. a mountain have? How much? U-235? Yeah. I don't know. It depends when the mountain was formed. If it was a recently formed mountain, it would have a lot more than a real old mountain. Okay. Yes? Well, like, a really old, like the oldest rock, like a four, four, billion, four billion years four billion, old. What are the oldest like, rocks? Like, point zero, 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 zero. Hardly in <laughs> Very little, yeah. So, we know also from opening up rocks what the atmosphere in early Earth was like because when a rock forms from liquid hot magma, 
that cools, it traps gases from the atmosphere inside the rock. Close up on first. So that if we open up a rock that's four billion years old, we know what the atmosphere was like four billion years ago. Because the atmosphere is captured in the rock. And here's what we know was in the atmosphere four billion years ago when the earth formed. There was water vapor, there was carbon dioxide, a lot of sulfur dioxide, this is what volcanoes belch up, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen cyanide, that's a poison, nitrogen and hydrogen. There was no free oxygen O2. You could not, if you got a time machine and you went back three billion years, you couldn't breathe because there would be no oxygen O2, no O2 gas. These are the same types of gases that are thrown up by volcanoes even today. So on early Earth there was a lot of volcanic activity. But there was no photosynthesis going on, we don't think, because there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. So if we were back two billion years, we wouldn't be able to breathe? You wouldn't be able to breathe because there was no oxygen. Well, how the dinosaurs were? They were re more recent than that, and that's one of the things we're going to learn. The dinosaurs were only 65 to 300 million years ago. We're talking about billions of years ago, way before the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs aren't real. Okay, that's right. So how do we know about living organisms? What living organisms existed in the past? We can also tell that from the rocks. This is showing you how a river will come to the ocean. And I don't know if you know about formation of rocks, you probably don't, but rivers bring with it eroded uh, land. A river will run through a mountain and tear the mountain up as it goes. Water has this ability. If you take apart a rock, you know what you have? You have sand. That's where sand comes from. Rock, eroded rock. If you take a rock and you rub it with water for millions of years, little pieces of the rock will come off. We call that sand. So billions and they of years float years down no the river. The sand floats down the river and gets deposited in the, on the ocean where the river meets the ocean. What were you going to say? I said billions of years ago, was there no sand? That's right. The earth started as complete rock. Before any crazy it started, bro. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> now, imagine a fish living in the ocean, swimming along, and it dies. Has a heart attack or something. And it floats to the bottom. Listen. It floats to the bottom, lands on the bottom, and eventually it's going to get covered up by sand. It's soft parts of its body, its flesh, its muscles skin will all be eaten away by bacteria, but often the bones remain. And sand will be piled on top of the bones, and as sand gets piled on top, layer by layer, sand coming from the, the rivers here, piles on top, you end up with layers of sand with bones caught in it. Told you not. Layers of sand with bones caught in it. And over millions of years of packing the sand down by more sand on top of it, the sand turns to rock again. It's called sedimentary rock. Geologists study it all the time. And we look at the fossils inside the rock. And the, the, the way the rock forms is the older fossils are on the bottom. And the younger fossils are on the top. The fossils towards the top are more recent than the ones below. We can radioactively date the rock to figure out which rocks are old and which rocks are young to figure this out. But it makes sense. If you have a pile of magazines on your counter, at home, uh, on your coffee table, the magazines on the bottom are older. The magazines on the top are more recent. Because you just throw your magazines down after you read them and pretty soon you have a pile. That's exactly what happens here. The fossils on the bottom are, are old. The fossils on the top are new. So we can see what life used to look like long ago from old fossils, 
and what life, life looks like more recently from newer fossils. And when we look at this, we can build a picture of what has lived in the past, the fossil record. Look at all the different types of fossils that they've found. Trace fossils are like footprints, traces of old organisms. Molds and casts, an impression of an organism. Something makes a dent in, uh, in the mud, the mud turns to stone. Then the, the dent fills in with sand and that forms what we call a cast. Yes. Yeah. You know, you said the mud thing. Uh huh. So, I mean, mud just from going back where it was. You step in the mud, and you don't always see your footprints. That's right, and those wouldn't form any fossils. Just like sometimes it happens. But sometimes you step in mud, and the footprint stays yeah. there. Yeah. And then, given the right circumstances, if it's not bothered, that mud can turn to stone. You've seen hard mud before that's all dried up. It's it's hard. It's hard mud, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> Here we have a replacement fossil where the original material of an organism is replaced with mineral crystals that can leave detailed replicas of hard or soft parts. And by the way, tomorrow in the lab I'll show you a bunch of fossils we'll look at. Petrified or petrified fossils. Empty pore spaces are filled by minerals such as in petrified wood. I don't know if you've seen, but there are places called petrified forests where, uh, where the entire forests have been made into stone. It actually looks like a forest, but the wood is turned into stone. Amber is tree sap. Tree sap that has hardened and sometimes has organisms caught in it. Here's a mosquito caught in some tree sap that hardened and turned to stone. Jurassic Park had that, where the guy had uh, mosquitoes trapped in amber and they would suck the DNA out of the mosquitoes because the mosquitoes had bitten dinosaurs and they got dinosaur DNA that way. Yep. Wouldn't, can't really happen, but it would be cool. It seems so like, kind of like on the floor. There's a trilobite fossil. I'll show you some fossils here. Wow. Ugly. Wait. I didn't Mammoth know. tusks in ice. Those are for sale. How old do you think that's our That's a that's a mammoth. Uh, the last mammoth died about ten thousand years ago. Yes. Would that be a fossil or is that just a bone? That's that might that could be the actual thing, not a fossil, but the actual thing. That's what we call original material. Good question. What's the most common type of fossil? Jurassic Park. Fish fossil. Nautilus. Probably molds. Molds, I think. Some molds. Nautilus. Some one of these two. There's an ichthyosaur. A placoderm, an ancient fish, Whoa. a fossil fern, ammonites, this is an extinct creature that looked kind of like a snail. Hold on, there's a dinosaur footprint. Hold on, Bennett, I've got couple conversations going on here, a couple conversations going on there. It's just one. Raise your hand if you want to ask something. Sorry. Yes, question. Okay. Out of the Pacific Ocean, uh, I think it was last year or two years ago, they found a fish that was like a descendant of that. It looks of so the placoderm. Yeah, it was like These were trying. ancient armored fish. They're extinct now, but they used to exist. There's a kid in a dinosaur <laughs> footprint. Oh, proof. If he were standing there 200 million years before that, he would have been crushed. We <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, you had your hand up. We went to a, a park somewhere in... 
extra common Texas, versus... like, they had this, like, river with dinosaur footprints in the bottom. It was awesome. Like, I don't know if it was a real park, but I'm like, well, real dinosaur feet, but it was, it was real. Yeah, that's what this is. I went to this place in Colorado. I went to this place in Colorado, and like, it was, You've it never was been a big slab of like, big rocks, and there's like dinosaur footprints in it. You've never been to Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not, uh, fossils are not as rare as you would think. They're, you can find them almost anywhere in any sedimentary rock you look. I'll show you some tomorrow. I got a whole collection in there. There's a scorpion encased in amber. There's uh, these are fossils of bacteria. You can look in, in my, these are microscopic fossils. Fossils you can only see under a microscope. Strong lights. Petrified wood. Video footage. Video footage. What? Uh -oh. We should take a field trip. <laughs> <laughs> to what? Puerto Rico. Quiet, please. Throughout the world, they provide the only evidence of what prehistoric life was like. Fossils are the traces or evidence of things that lived in the past. There are different kinds of fossils, and they formed in a variety of ways. In some cases, the process began when a prehistoric animal died, and its soft parts, the skin, muscles, and internal organs, decomposed or rotted away. Sediments such as silt from shallow streams buried the bones and teeth that remained. Over millions of years, more sediments buried the skeleton deeper. Under enormous pressure, the sand and silt around the remains turned to rock. Gradually, the bones petrified. This means that the materials making up the bones were replaced by minerals. More millions of years passed. During this time, erosion and weathering stripped away layers of sediment and exposed the fossil remains at the surface of the ground, where they could be discovered. Usually, fossils have formed only from the hard parts of a living thing, such as the bones or teeth of an animal or the pollen of a plant. But sometimes, fossils have formed from soft tissue, such as a leaf or flower, or an animal's skin. This would happen when a plant or animal was buried so quickly that the soft parts didn't have time to decompose. Fossils can also be molds or impressions left in rock, such as this mold of a sand dollar. You can see how such fossils are formed by making a mold of a shell. When you press a shell against a piece of clay and then remove the shell, you can see its impression in the clay. Sometimes a fossil is a whole animal. This prehistoric insect got caught in the sap of a plant. The sap hardened, becoming amber, preserving the insect inside. Fossils can be any signs of things that lived in the past. This footprint, for example, is a fossil. It was left by a dinosaur in mud that later hardened into rock. So here we see some layers of fossils, and like I say, the way it works is the oldest ones are on the bottom, and the youngest ones are on the top. I want the one I actually let us see. So A is the youngest, F is the oldest. Quiet. Relative dating. Relative dating is a method used to determine the age of rocks by comparing the rocks with younger and older rock layers. And yeah. Okay. The, the rocks on the bottom must be older than these because of the way they relate. Well, it was a dinosaur point. Never mind. Yes. Don't they have, in, like, today, don't they have, like, machines that can find the bones? Like, sort of like a no. body scan or something like that? Um, they have radar that they can bounce through uh, different levels of the ground, to the, and it bounces, it comes back differently when it hits bones versus rock or, or dirt. So they do have some machines that can do that. Aren't the people that find bones called like archaeologists? Archaeologists or paleontologists. Yeah. 
I just thought this was cool because at uh, my old school last year, my history teacher was an archaeologist and she did well, she did a bunch of different things. And what is that machine called? Because we got to roll it across where like our field was and like we found different things. We wanted to dig it up. You didn't have to dig it up? No, like it showed us like where it was in the ground. I don't know if she knew like somebody who had. You know, it's like. I don't know, there was one thing that we had to put it in and then it showed us like the bounce of it and then there was another thing with like these big wheels like this big and then we had to push it. I don't know what that is. Where did you go to school? Sounds pretty cool. Miss Wait. Grizzle, your teacher? Hold on just a second. Hannah. Was it, was it a fertilizer? It's like ashes of bones. It looks pretty dark. Yeah, it's just dark material that doesn't really have a lot of fossils in it. And what we see, listen. What we see when we look back through the fossils, through the different layers, we see that the older you get, the less and less living things you have. And at really ancient ages of, of rock, you have nothing. all the organisms are microscopic. Micro so we think that microscopic organisms came first in the history of life. After and only later did macroscopic, larger organisms that you can see come. But we're going to talk about that. Bro, what's that area just above all the microscopic stuff? Yeah. Here? Oh, above that. Here? Darker. It's just lower. a different layer, a darker layer of rock. The rock and fossil. <laughs> Here we show a common a common radioactive element used to uh, used to date bones is called C14. In all of your bones, there's a certain amount of uh, C14. It's a type of carbon that's radioactive, and when, when bones are buried and they sit in the ground for a long period of time, the C14 changes from carbon into nitrogen. And so you can look at the amount of C14 that's left and get an idea of how old the fossil is. If, all, if, if there's only 20% of the original amount of C14 left, you have about a 15,000 year old fossil. If there's half of the original amount of C14 left, the fossil's about 5,700 years old. And so, again, even in bones, you can use radioactive dating to tell how old your fossils are. And this gives scientists good clues on when these organisms ran around and existed. We know that dinosaurs lived from 300 million years ago to 65 million years ago. We know that through radioactive dating. They get very accurate records of how old these fossils are. And if you turn in your books to page 397, turn in your books to 397. Yeah, but you can't see all that on there. That's okay. It's in your book on 397. This is the geologic time scale. And you're going to have to know, and as a matter of fact, if you roll the essay for this chapter for next test, you're going to have to tell me the different eras of the geological time scale and what organisms existed in each era. Easy peasy. So I'm going to go over them real quick here, and then we'll spend more time on it tomorrow. I can do that if I was a paleontologist. The era that we are in right now is called the Cenozoic Era. It's the most recent era. It's the era of mammals. And uh, there's also a lot of flowering plants. Um, the mammals came around after the Mesozoic Era. The Mesozoic Era was the age of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs all went extinct. At the end of the Mesozoic Era, there was a mass extinction. A meteor hit the earth, killed almost all the dinosaurs. Is that proven? Uh, yeah, pretty much, and I'll talk about the evidence for that tomorrow. Wait, for a meteor hit the earth, wouldn't that be a big crater? Yeah, there is one. They found it near uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in, in Mexico. How did they kill all the dinosaurs in the world? 
Did they Ooh, it threw up a bunch of debris that blocked out sunlight for several years, and all the plants died, and then there was nothing to eat, and then all the, big, all the large animals died. Yeah, how, how did the debris fly up? When something hits the ground, it goes... And it blows a bunch of stuff up in the air. But what, I mean, Every time a volcano goes up... How could it can I do this? Gravity was Let me do this. Every time a volcano blows stuff into the air, it takes years for it to settle out. How would it not if that? there were enough material up there, it would block out all sunlight. It would take years to settle out. The particles are so small, they stay up in the air floating for a long time. So Just as if you throw a feather up in the air, it takes a long time for it to descend. Sometimes the material is so small it takes years for it to descend. But if there that small as sun that we threw it. Not if there's enough of the particles. What about like on the other side of the world? Like really it moves, it goes all the way around the world. That is so crazy. Yes, Logan. It's a small sun. Is it crazy? What do you guys He had his hand up with that. I'm seeing hands up Yes. The small stuff uh, when it threw it up, did it break the atmosphere or stay under it? I was just asking. Stays in the atmosphere. Right, so it wouldn't burn up, right? Nope. Don't think Doesn't it. go above the atmosphere, it stays in the atmosphere. Uh, Gravity keeps it from going out in outer space. Okay. <laughs> Questions over here? Okay. Yes. So, like when the meteor hit, dust was like, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, everything died. Yeah, Not everything. Now. Well, not everything. Just the big animals that had to eat a lot of stuff. What about, so then, like, what was left? The small animals that don't have to eat so much. Like, but wouldn't the large animals be like, 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 What's that? Wouldn't the large animals be small animals? They could eat. They could eat what they can, but a lot of them were plant eaters. What the fish? A lot of the fish died too because they needed a lot of food as well. The food chain in the seas um, are rely on algae, which rely on sunlight, which was blocked out. So large, large animals in the ocean died too. Yes. Uh, could that happen again? Could. Or, or would, or would like the, or would NASA shoot it down or something? Depends. We talk about that in astronomy. You can take take that in twelfth grade. They can shoot a big, like frisbee type thing, cut in half. Woo! <coughs> okay, can I continue? Hey, Bennett, open the blind and quit asking dumb questions. There may be one hit. We don't. We never know. There may be one. We, we don't know when it'll hit. If ever, it might. Tell us why you open the blind. What's that? Did one go between the Earth and the Moon like 60? Like a, just a few years ago. Uh, no, yeah. no. Wasn't nearly as big as the one that hit the dinosaur. There we go. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. It might, might get us all. Did it kill us? It could if it was big enough. So it's an actual Jesus would stop it. If it landed like in China, we would Jesus would like that. We'd all be happy. Okay, I guess we can't make it through all this. Dang we'll it. I want to film. Right. Stop the film. Pro out. Well, are you out? Yes, I'm out. You gonna say it? Nope. <laughs> Just turn it on. Thank you. Twenty minutes later, you're out. You're out.